I V M. Hey everyone, you know what we haven't done all season a two part episode and we saved the best for last because nothing gets us going as much as financial, financial fraud. fraud. Have you ever wondered why women don't do more crime? Well, we're here to tell you. There's misconduct all the time. Women are thieves and murderers. That's gross misconduct. Con artists, money launderers. Hmm, criminal misconduct. Financial fraud that's hard to track. Take some planning, but still misconduct. Even breaching a contract. That's more civil though. Misconduct. Misconduct. We tell you all about women that suck. Things that make you say, "What the?" It's misconduct. Hello, 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 and welcome to Misconduct. We are a podcast about women that did crime stuff, or got accused of crime stuff, or are currently battling long, hard battles in court over crime. I am Ragvi, and I am Nisha. And on today's episode, we have a case study that's equal parts yay feminism and oh no, not like that, girl. <laughs> <laughs> so our episode today is part one of our two-part series on the famous Chanda Kocher. Mm-hmm. So Chanda Kocher is a household name of sorts in urban India, a woman who rose the corporate ranks with hard work and sheer grit. A woman whose fight for a position of power in the cutthroat corporate world is well documented. I mean, it's like chef's kiss at this point. That's true. She was the former managing director and chief executive officer of ICICI Bank, mm-hmm. an Indian financial institution with multinational businesses and branches all over Asia, Middle East, Africa, Europe, North America. Did we get this from the press release section? Maybe. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this made Chanda the first woman to ever head an Indian financial institution. That's right. And ICICI Bank Bank's prominence in the Indian and international financial markets rose exponentially in the time that she spent at the company where she started off as a management trainee and then she just moved up the ranks to the top spot. So between 1984 to 2017, Chanda was basically seen as a leading figure at the bank, being on the board of directors and you know sometimes also chairman on most of the bank's subsidiaries. Chanda Kocher's power and influence allowed ICICI Bank to extend its businesses beyond conventional banking services mm-hmm. with flourishing verticals in insurance, securities, retail and many more. Mm-hmm. She's also been bestowed with a series of awards for her work, ranging from being featured in multiple issues of Forbes magazine's top influential business persons mm-hmm. to being part of important international delegations to the International Monetary Fund and the World mm-hmm. Economic Forum mm-hmm. to even being awarded the Padma Bhushan, one of India's top civilian awards for distinguished service of a high order to the country. And there is more. So Chandra is credited for growing ICICI Bank into the second largest financial institution in India. And she is given all credit for taking the bank's asset size upwards of 6 lakh crore rupees, which is 6 trillion rupees. How uh, many she, zeros? I, I don't know. That's why I wrote lakh crore in words. <laughs> In a script as opposed to zeros because I would have lost it. So she also sailed the bank through the 2009 financial crisis with Mm -hmm. a mixed asset management plan. So India by and large ended up escaping the worst of the crisis and ICICI Bank's measures contributed heavily to that. And all of this is fine and good. She seems strong, smart, swift, a sturdy businesswoman. Mm -hmm. So why then did a woman of her stature suddenly go from MD and CEO to Mm -hmm. arrested overnight by the Indian Central Bureau of Investigation. Oh no. On 23rd December 2022, Chanda Kocher and her husband Deepak Kocher were arrested by the CBI on charges of bank fraud. So she's been accused of misusing her power of position at the bank to grant loans to persons and companies that she favoured. She's also been accused of using her position to enrich herself and her family members, including her husband, their friends and their business associates. (sighs) <sighs> Alleged, of course. Mm-hmm. So under various corporate laws in India, a director or any other person in a managerial position has some fiduciary or financial duties that they owe to the shareholder of the company. And matters like 
you know, loans from one company to another, they're really highly regulated, especially if your company happens to be listed on the stock exchange, yeah. right? So failure to abide by these rules is allegedly what Chanda is accused of and with her husband and other acquaintances apparently being beneficiaries of all of these rule breakings. So the most prominent of these allegations is that Chanda uh, sanctioned certain loans to a private company in a criminal conspiracy with others to cheat ICICI Bank, the company that she worked for. And the loan sanction amount, about mm-hmm. 3,250 crore Indian rupees, which is about mm-hmm. 32.5 billion rupees, all right. given to one debt-ridden corporate, the Videocon Group. <sighs> in time, her personal and professional stock value dropped significantly as well. Mm-hmm. A CNBC op-ed from 2022 went so far as to say, Chanda Kocher, the woman who broke the glass ceiling and soon stepped on its shard. Huh. Pretty cool headline. It's a pretty cool headline. I can't deny that. Yeah. So in today's episode, we're focusing on the initial years of Chanda's life. So we didn't think we could do justice with this entire case with just one episode. There's a lot about Chanda's life herself and then, you know, a series of steps of things that happened that we want to make sure we cover clearly. So today will be primarily Chanda's early life, who she is, how she got where she is, how influential she really is. And we'll be delving into a curious complaint made about her in 2016 that was dismissed and how complaints were brought up again just months later with similar accusations. Mm -hmm. And in part two, we can delve deeper into the cases that followed, including Chanda and her husband's arrest. Before we get into it, our usual disclaimers, in case you've all forgotten, this podcast is not meant for children unless you want to teach your kids how to not be (laughs) a corporate loan giver, which is a very niche subject. I don't think most of children will be affected by that. Mm -hmm. And of course, we have loads of discussion on financial fraud. Listener discretion is advised. So let's get into Chanda Kocher's early life. She was born on 17th November 1961 as Chanda Advani in the city of Jodhpur, the state of Rajasthan in India. She was from a middle class family from a Sindhi community who have their origins in the north of India. She spent a decent chunk of her early years in Jaipur, another city in Rajasthan itself, wrapping up her secondary education at St. Angela Sophia School. Oh, sounds like a convent school. Mm. I can smell the discipline and the perfectly cut nails from here. Have you ever been to a convent school? Not really, but I feel like my upbringing effectively became convent <laughs> school E. Because I remember I had nail polish on once and I was sent back home. Oh so. my God. Yeah it's, yeah, it's pretty much like that. And like I went for one year and then I remember there was this one day like I didn't have lunch on time or something and I got yelled at for that. I'm like, What is your problem, dude? Mm-hmm. Just I like let me not eat. It's fine. But yeah, it's this this nail polish thing. I wore that nail polish for annual day. Nice. Like literally the day nice. prior. Yeah. So <laughs> it just doesn't make any sense to me. It is what it is. Yeah, there's just a lot of trauma. Convent schools mm-hmm. are very stressful, but they build character Yay. at some cost. <laughs> So around 1979, she moved to Mumbai, the Indian Mm -hmm. city of dreams. Mm -hmm. Here, she got herself a bachelor's degree in commerce from Jai Hind College, affiliated with the Mumbai University. Mm -hmm. In 1982, she graduated from college and began studying to be a cost accountant with the ICAI or the Institute of Cost Accountants of India. Yes, Mm -hmm. it's quite tough. Mm -hmm. Uh, It appears that she achieved this in less than four years, which is like, whoa, cool. I mean, it's not impossible, but it's a lot of work. Yeah, you can ask my dad. He is an ICAI fellow and the Mm -hmm. exams are not a joke. He like, it's not just the exams. You kind of spend your entire life studying for that discipline just so you're constantly updated, you know? Yeah, true. Mm -hmm. Uh, Chanda also got herself a master's degree in management studies from the Jamnalal Bajaj Institute of Management Studies in Mumbai, which Mm -hmm. is like, what? Yeah. Uh, She got top marks in her year earning her the JN Bose gold medal for academic merit. Nice. She also earned the Walk Hard gold medal for excellence in management studies. Hmm. So education was very important to Chanda. In an interview much later in her life, she is noted to have attributed this thirst for knowledge to her parents. She Hmm. said, and we quote, What my parents believed was that the best wealth they could give to us children was to educate us and give us that foundation. Nice. That's nice. It's also important to note that all ICAI candidates need to complete articleship hours as they're studying for their exams, Mm -hmm. which means Chanda was both studying and working from the age of 20 or so. Yeah, I think even both my dad and my brother have basically been working since the age of 19. Yeah. Studying to be an accountant is a lot of work. Finance is... 
It is. And especially, yeah. so I did my BCom and mm-hmm. accounts made like very less sense to me. <laughs> if I had to do that all my life, I would have just been like, nah, please. <laughs> yeah. Dude, I use a, a calculator to just calculate things which have multiple zeros, you know, <laughs> not even like, it's so obvious. I, if, if, if I'm calculating 10,000 plus 20,000, it's obviously one plus 30, two and then the <laughs> thousands. Yeah, dude, it shouldn't be so hard. Like I'm <laughs> beyond stupid with, mum, with numbers. That's it. Also, this profession is rife with abuse, both financial and mm-hmm. mental. A lot of accountants work very, very long hours for very little pay at the start of their careers. Right. Which is something that Chanda also experienced when she officially entered the workforce. Hmm, okay. In 1984, Chanda Kocher started working at the Industrial Credit and Investment Corporation of India. I never heard of this place. Girl, it stands for ICICI. <laughs> oh, I didn't, I didn't know ICICI had a full form. I never bothered asking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so before it was a bank, ICICI was actually a joint venture into India between mm-hmm. the World Bank and certain public and private sector banks in the country. It started as a project meant to bring funds into Indian industries, mm-hmm. working sort of as an intermediary between investors and projects that needed financial financing in the country. Mm -hmm. So this worked really well in the early 90s to early 2000s when India's economic policy was focused on liberalization. Mm -hmm. So when we were opening up uh, the economy to external investors and more private ownership. In that time, ICICI would become ICICI Bank Mm -hmm. with the 1990s and 2000s seeing diversification in terms of the types of securities they held and and what they offered to their customers. Yeah, and that's the period basically when Chanda was like... yeah. Right up there, right? So, mm-hmm. we said Chanda had joined ICICI in 1984. And like Nisha said, the organization pretty much had just started off. And she began her career as a management trainee. So, her roles were pretty diverse. It involved handling project appraisal, evaluation and monitoring. Hmm, that's some vague words. That's right. Sorry, I actually missed some words. Synergy, paradigm mm. shift. Ooh, ah. Unprecedented. <gasps> Ooh, I want to try. Mm-hmm. Circle back. Mm. Take this offline Ooh. and <clears throat> bandwidth. <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god! Stop it! You make me blush. <laughs> it's corporate. <laughs> it's corporate ASMR. <laughs> I love these words so much. They mean nothing and everything at the same my, time. My favorite is innovation. Oh, <laughs> sick! <laughs> love this stuff. But um, you're right in the words that you use generally, and because yes. I did intend for them to be vague, because a large part of Chanda's initial role at ICICI was kind of around understanding the scope and return of investment on major projects, mm. especially like industrial ones, like textile, paper and cement, which I'm listing three very different yeah, industries. <laughs> yeah. So the thing is, this stuff is very different from the kind of technology investments we see nowadays. Um, mm. Retail and infrastructure have real assets, right? So it's not an app. So it means the funding will actually have to go into infrastructure and real estate projects that are massive. Hmm. So crores and crores of rupees with zeros that you really can't even count. That's kind of how it is. Sounds like a lot of responsibility. It is, but uh, she rose to the challenge. So Mm -hmm. uh, let me pull out some quotes from interviews which can give you a little more context about how her life was at ICICI. And these are all her own words, right? So an interview with the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, Chanda spoke about her rise at ICICI Bank. She said, Mm -hmm. And we quote, ICICI transformed itself from a corporate bank into a retail bank and now a universal bank. So although I've been with the same organization for the last 20 years, I've created and run different businesses. I joined on the corporate side of the bank. Then when infrastructure financing became a a big thing in India, I set up the infrastructure financing practice for the bank. When commercial banking opened up for the private sector, I set up the retail banking division for ICICI and grew it substantially. I then ran the international side of the ICICI bank for a few years. Having run all the businesses, I am now a supervisor overseeing a number of functions. Finance, risk, audit, compliance, industrial relations, all those kinds of things. It's been a great journey for me. Oof. I like the first line that she said about I've been in the same organization but I've created and run different businesses. I feel like I should put that on my LinkedIn profile. (laughs) Yeah, I was literally just thinking that. I was like, what a great way to start your series. That's what I was thinking. (laughs) So, uh, Chanda herself described her own management style in the same interview where Mm -hmm. she says, I think you need to be, first of all, adaptable so you can quickly understand and move forward in new business situations. Mm -hmm. Second, you need to treat each challenge as an opportunity. I treated this challenge as an opportunity, not just to learn from my own development, but also to create something new for the organization. Hmm. 
these quotes sum up her professional life pretty well and thank god she gave so many interviews also she could have literally said this exact same thing as a ce as any ceo as the pandemic started yeah that's true <laughs> <laughs> because you have to give them cookies for saying oh you can stay home so you don't die congrats <laughs> Here, bonus of thirty-two million dollars for this <laughs> statement. Thanks. But yeah, I mean, Chanda Kochar uh, clearly knows her stuff, and she also mm-hmm. got some good media training. It looks like because yep. um, I've been trying to look for really old interviews of hers, and I remember, uh, you know, for us it was so difficult to find something because I guess she was a little more conscious about speaking. Hmm. And then later on in her life, once she hit like her stride, she is very happy to say words <laughs> to the media. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So in any case, by 1994, Chanda was appointed as the assistant general manager at ICICI. Now, I'm going to give you a trajectory that moves really, really quickly because mm. in less than two years after this, she becomes a deputy general manager. And then three years later, straight up general manager. Girl, whoa, take yeah. a take a moment, pause, no. reflect. How, no, shut up. <laughs> How dare you? Girl boss. So the, the bank's retail business got a lot more focus in the year 2000, which is... when she suddenly you know started becoming the forerunner hmm. for a much size like more senior position and by 2001 she was the executive director by 2006 she was a deputy managing director at ICICI back and in 3 years she made chief financial officer What? and joint managing director oh my god dude like yeah take a beat take a breath no <laughs> never <laughs> never <laughs> yeah in 2009 icici bank announced that chanda kochar would be the new md and chief executive officer at the bank so this made her directly responsible for all of the bank's activities in india and abroad and this is when she was made a board member in a series of icici Oof. subsidiary companies across the world all right so uh, nisha mhm you and also everybody else do you want to hear a list of the stuff that she was responsible for <gasps> oh yes let's do it game show style like yeah. like we're listing all of the things that you can win on this game show yes all right cue music let's go things that chanda kochar was in charge of finance planning and strategy communications global treasury principal investments and trading risk management legal functions day to day guidance and administrative matters relating to the compliance and internal audit functions catering <laughs> wait that doesn't sound right <laughs> yeah that's actually not on the list i just <laughs> figured if she was important enough to taste the food that her employees <laughs> might <laughs> as well but <laughs> but what we're trying to say with that ridiculous display is that chanda was a woman of many many responsibilities including a family i know you're waiting mm-hmm. for that mm-hmm. <laughs> so she was married to deepak kochar uh, still is a harvard business school alum that she met during her masters course and today she and deepak have two children now if you were any publication worth your salt you would be asking right about now but she's a woman how did she do it all <gasps> indeed <laughs> balancing <laughs> home life and the work life <laughs> Now no one will ask a man this like sir how do you run your business and keep your wife happy and raise children this is mm-hmm. never like this is a question i've never heard no nope. uh, but loads of people asked chanda about it like yeah. everyone just had to know how a woman managed to do so much was mm-hmm. she superhuman <gasps> was she no okay she's just <laughs> a regular person who okay. can multitask <laughs> so Chanda has acknowledged that her husband and children have been very accommodating to her career goals. Mm-hmm. She said in an interview, "Thankfully, I have an ecosystem of in-laws, parents, and husband who uh-huh. are my rocks." Oh, that's that's nice. Yeah. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. she also said in a separate interview, mm-hmm. "I have it all because my children do not whine and cry when I was not there." Oh, I mean, <laughs> congrats yes. on your children who don't know how to cry. I, don't know. <laughs> I mean. I don't know if she actually knew that or she just hired people to take care of them that it was never like a thing a problem. Mm. Yeah. It's right? possible. It is possible. It's easy know. to have it all when you're rich. That's true. <laughs> exactly. This is like the uh, successful version equivalent of how we say, you know, you're not ugly, you're just yeah, poor. Yeah. Exactly. So it's like you don't have it's not like you don't have time in the day. You just have 60,000 people to delegate everything. <laughs> exactly. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> But there is another quote that tells us more about her than anything else we've said so far. And that is clearly for an organization to move on, it is the job of the leader to be that sponge that takes the stress from inside and the outside. Oh, 
uh, I okay. I don't think I would ever give that much to a job. <laughs> like maybe my cats, you know, because they own yeah. me. But my <laughs> my job doesn't own me. So I, I mean, wouldn't. I would to an extent. Well, uh, not like her, I guess. Yeah, but yeah. but I generally enjoy like being productive. So I understand where she's coming mm. from. Yeah. Um, as a leader, especially, you often need to brush past the stupid day-to-day stuff and absorb all the negative things that are thrown at you. And mm. you just have to focus on getting your job done. So I admire that in her. I suppose. Hmm. But you know what I admire? What? The other shows on IVF. Hey, we <laughs> haven't done this segment. in a long time. I know, I know. <laughs> well done. I, thank you. Welcome back everyone after the break. We last spoke a ton about our resident overachiever Chanda Kocher mm-hmm. and her career trajectory at ICICI Bank. Yeah. And now we bring you more information about <laughs> Chanda Kocher that will make you feel like a worthless sack of poop. <laughs> so between 2001 to 2005, Chanda won the award for leading the best retail bank in India by the Asian banker. Five years in a row. Yeah. <laughs> Shit. Okay, go on. She's like the Michael Schumacher of banking. Congratulations. I managed Chanda. to get in one <laughs> F1 one F1. thing in there. <laughs> for the uninitiated, Nisha is really into F1. And I yeah, thought it would man. be a phase. But no, she Here truly stay. enjoys it. Yeah. It's pretty kick-ass actually. Good for you. <laughs> uh, in 2005, the Economic Times awarded her Business Woman of the Year. From 2005 to 2007, she held positions 47th, 37th and 33rd hmm. in Fortune Magazine's list of most powerful women in the business. Hmm, okay. In 2008, she was placed 25th. Oh, all right. Just yeah. getting better. Mm-hmm. In 2009, she debuted at number 20 straight away in the Forbes World's 100 Most Powerful Women list. Oh. And this made her the second Indian in the list after Sonia Gandhi, the leader of the Indian National Congress Party. Oh, damn. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, 2010 was a bad year for her. She fell okay. to number 92 on that list. Poor woman. How will she ever recover? Oh, she she recovered by making it to number 32 by ah. the year 2017. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> what else? Yes. Also, Bloomberg Markets featured her mm-hmm. as one of 50 most influential people in global finance. Um, in 2011, she was awarded the Padma Bhushan, which is one of the most prestigious civilian mm-hmm. awards in India. Uh, she was also appointed a member of various business delegations between India and the US. So, clearly she has an international mm-hmm. flavor at this point. She's, she's Priyanka Chopra. She is Miss <laughs> Mr. Worldwide and Miss World. Which song was that? Was that um it was that Pitbull song? It's that beach one. <laughs> yeah. Exotic. Exotic. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> That's the one. So um speaking of exotic, she was also president of the International Monetary Conference, which brought together leading financial institutions and their executives. Um Chanda was also there's a long list, okay. I'm gonna just get mm-hmm. through. She is the deputy chairman of the Indian Banks Association. She's on the board of the National Institute of the Securities Market and the Institute of International Finance. She's in the Indian Prime Minister's Council on Trade and Industry. She co-chaired the World Economic Forum's annual meeting in 2011. She received multiple honorary degrees for her work and she's recognized for sealing the ICICI Bank through the global banking crisis. Okay, I'm done. Wow. That's that's the most I can do. You had to take a breath just reading out the list. Yeah. She never stopped. Yeah. <laughs> so, in 2015, her annual salary hit about 6 crore rupees a year, mm-hmm. not accounting for stock options and bonuses and such. Mm-hmm. Her net worth was estimated to be about 80 crore rupees at this point. Not accounting for her husband's own independent wealth. Wow, so basically she had it good, right? So, so bleeping good. Mm. So do you feel like shit yet? Oh, 100%. The moment you said Chanda Kocher, I was like, oh, goddamn. Yeah. (laughs) But yeah, we recognize that our petty jealousy is rooted in some appreciation as well. Speak for yourself. You are speaking (laughs) for yourself. Go on. (laughs) Like for a woman, first of all, to break through that glass ceiling, it Mm -hmm. was near impossible in the time period that we are considering. Yeah. Just for context, in August 2022, Women achieved the all-time high of holding executive positions in the global 500 companies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, how much do you think the all-time high was? 
like 40 percent oh my sweet summer child it mm-hmm. was 4.8 percent what yes um in india okay. though about 17.1 percent of board of directorship positions is being are being held by women so oh okay that's that's cool that's so much mm. better yeah yeah not so quick so okay. it used to be seven percent okay it went mm. up because the companies act mandated a female member on the board of certain companies from 2015 sometime oh mm-hmm Yeah, why do we still need women's rights? Exactly. Mm-hmm. So what I'm trying to say here is that there is a reason that Chanda Kochar was a household name at that time. Mm-hmm. It was because there were like four women in business, not yeah. like in in finance, in just in business everywhere. <laughs> so it was Chanda Kochar, Indra Nui who headed PepsiCo, mm-hmm. Arundhati Bhattacharya who was heading uh, SBI Bank and Kiran Mazumdar Shaw of Biocon. Oh, you're forgetting uh, Shobhana Bhatia of HD Media. Oh, how mistaking of me oh my god it was <laughs> language five women how dare i the menonists will feel so bad yeah that changes everything <laughs> just, but the point is i'm trying to say that chanda was almost mm-hmm. unparalleled in her ambitions and her achievements and right. she earned it to just through just sheer hard work i guess but uh, do you know what they say the uh, higher you climb mm. the harder it is to breathe cuz there's What? no oxygen <laughs> what what's the sorry what's the saying again ha ah, the higher you climb the harder you fall yes and god damn that fall was hard mm-hmm. so um let's start with the year 2012 so we're going to try to keep this chronological but we yeah. also want to give it an element of <gasps> oh so <laughs> we're going to go back and forth a little bit okay so just keep up with the years you will tell you which year it is don't worry yeah. so in 2012 chanda kochar was featured in fortune magazine for like i don't know the 70th time or whatever <laughs> uh the eighth time actually but this time she was also featured with indra nui and others and 2012 was also the year of her bloomberg global finance recognition so it was a great year for chanda mm-hmm. but 2012 was also the year that icici bank approved a loan for the videocon group so quick you know background for what videocon was a lot of you might already know videocon was a manufacturing company that was founded by a man named benu gopal dhut so the company focused on electronic goods primarily home appliances wireless and internet products and a bunch of other things and its tv business many of mm. you might know was super lucrative back in the day especially in the 90s and early 2000s uh, and it had an estimated value valuation of 5.5 billion US dollars. So in 2009 it would launch mobile phones as well and then later it would move into petroleum and more telecom products and over time though Videocon's debts ended up outweighing its revenues. And what do you think companies do when they run out of money? They go to other companies and say, "Please sir, can I have some cash?" Yes, but that's please, ma'am, to you <gasps> because Veena Gopal of Videocon Group went to Chanda Kochar. Yeah. So, yeah, the thing is Veena Gopal knew Chanda from before partly because she's like very famous mm-hmm. and partly because he was friends with her husband Deepak Kochar and we can cover that bit later it'll come up trust us. Yeah. So between 2009 2011 Videocon racked up a pretty hefty debt that is being investigated today because we don't know the specific numbers just yet uh, mm-hmm. but he did go to Chanda and she decided to help him out so an overall set of loans was approved by Chanda on behalf of ICICI bank to the tune of 3250 crore rupees that is 32.5 billion rupees in all so that's like 400 million US dollars mm-hmm. so Let me give you guys an idea of how much money that actually is. Oh, okay, oh, do it again. You do it game show style again. Cue the music. <laughs> For 400 million dollars, you can buy Leonardo da Vinci's Salvatore Mundi painting made in the 16th century. Ooh. You can buy the entire West Ham football team. But would you want to? That's a whole other question. Hmm. You can buy the Star of Africa, a 530.2 carat diamond stolen originally by the British royal family. I would actually steal that back, Doom 2 style. <laughs> the Villa di Balbianello in Lake Como, Italy, where Deepika Padukone and Ranveer Singh got married. Oh, that's nice. Well, you can buy two of them or oh. one and use the rest of the money for maintenance. That is smart. And if you're Andrew Tate, you can buy three Bugattis a week for the whole year. Wow! One for the week, one for the weekend, and an extra for prison. I hope that puts some perspective, mm-hmm. because this was a lot of money—the three thousand 
250 crore rupees that's right now videocon was not really considered super careful with this money back in the day mm-hmm. in fact while they were bleeding money videocon was contemplating putting in a bid to buy deccan chargers a What? team that plays for the indian premier cricket league shut up <laughs> <laughs> they backed out of it in september okay. 2012 okay. though probably just out of shame can companies feel shame no not no they can't but i thought companies were people yeah that's just to hide money also most people don't feel shame <laughs> oh that's fair yeah uh but like neither did videocon <laughs> yeah. uh, because they went off and decided to sponsor another league team the oh. mumbai indians for a year after that that sounds like a great use of hmm. money yeah so basically there was always some question as to whether videocon really used the money well Uh-huh. Additionally, there were some doubts about the exact amount that went out to Videocon and why. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it was later found out that between 2009 and 2011, right after Chanda became the MD and CEO of ICICI, the bank granted about 1875 crore rupees in term loans to Videocon in just those 2 years. Okay. In September 2009, an additional 300 crore rupee loan was also given mm-hmm. when Chanda was the head of the loan sanctions committee. Okay. There were other disbursements over some time which mm-hmm. eventually led to that giant 3250 crore rupee tag right mm-hmm. uh, it appears a total of about 6 loans were handed out oh however okay. at that time that is between 2009 to 2012 mm-hmm. all those loans were sanctioned without much pushback okay even in july 2015 a good half a decade after the first loans were made mm-hmm. former chairman of icici bank kv kamat said icici bank is in great hands chanda will take it to greater heights and i have no doubts about it mm-hmm. in fact no one really even made a sound about these loans until the year 2016 and what happened in 2016 we will what? tell you right after the break <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back after the break everyone. We are now in the year 2016 when I have been given to understand by Nisha when we went on break that many many movies came out. <laughs> many Marvel movies also came out. So Nisha definitely saw a majority of them. Congratulations Nisha. Yay. <laughs> yeah. But in the year 2016 something else happened with the actual case we're discussing. Uh something interesting that was actually casually brushed under the carpet. So in April 2016 a man named Arvind Gupta smelled something weird about this loan arrangement that ICICI Bank was signing off on. So Arvind was just an ordinary investor in both ICICI Bank and Videocon and he did something that most of us investors don't really do. Hmm. He read the company's annual returns. Ah, is he also an accountant because who can go through that many numbers? He might just be because <laughs> I thought hey maybe this time I should look up No. Video con and ICICI banks returns and I went to the MCA website immediately oh, and said no. sorry you haven't logged in 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 3 months so I just gave up right there. I didn't even <laughs> did even bother. I, I didn't even look no. for the documents. I just said we're not doing this. <laughs> I am not even signing in. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> so what Arvind did, which none of us usually do, is that he checked the number of loans that were made by ICICI towards hmm. Videocon, and then he he also checked where Videocon was spending that loan money. Remember huh. what Nisha said about various cricket endeavors? <laughs> That's where everything Correct. was going. So he kind of put together a whole map of whatever was going on between ICICI and Videocon at the time. I'm imagining that guy from uh, what is that show? It's always sunny in Philadelphia. Uh huh. Yeah, like Charlie. We are yeah, Charlie yeah. with like this big board of like newspaper clippings and long yeah. balance. She's just pinned to the wall, yeah. and there's like lines everywhere, thread everywhere, and question marks all over the place. And he's just like, "Let me explain." Yeah. <laughs> I can totally see that happening. And like giant pictures of Chanda everywhere, yeah. just like, "Where is she walking to? Is she going to the gym or is she going to video? I don't know, something or the other, you know." <laughs> and uh, I've been actually noticed through all of this work that mm. Mediacon's market value was, um, how do you say it? It was. in the toilet is that french is <laughs> that is indeed the most frenchiest corporate term i could think of in the toilet the toilet so- Yes, correct. So he would later tell news agencies, and we quote: "The government should order a forensic investigation in order to check why loans were given to a sinking 
company. Mm. So more specifically, he would point towards three people. The first person he pointed a finger at was Venugopal Doot, the man who founded Mediacon Group. So Arvind believed that Venugopal transferred his loan money to other companies in which Venugopal himself had majority shares. Nice. So it's a spec. Sus, sus, sus. Uh, the second person involved, as per Arvind, is Deepak Kochar. So he alleged that the husband of Chanda Kochar was an intermediary of sorts and also had some monetary interest in the companies that Venu Gopal owned. Arvind effectively accused Deepak of enriching himself in this whole process. The last person that Arvind pointed his finger at was Chanda Kochar herself. So he believed that Chanda was effectively a primary beneficiary of all these loans through her husband. I'm sure he had the numbers to back it up too, especially if he's saying it with such confidence. I don't doubt that he did. So perfect. So how did the media treat this? Do we have an interview with him from this time? Uh, no. Media didn't care too much about it then. <laughs> mm. Mm. Nice. Yeah. So was there a complaint or something made? Because this smells of criminal conspiracy to defraud, right? Mm, I smell it too, but... Uh... No complaints for me. I don't think anyone is. Anyone else smelt it. Wow, excellent. Mm. We're all about to be very disappointed by the system, aren't we? Yes, very much so. <laughs> In fact, the fact that you were optimistic <laughs> is pretty much your problem. <laughs> so it appears that Arvind Gupta did complain, but nobody did anything about it. So sources say, well, Arvind Gupta says uh, that he wrote to multiple authorities, including the Reserve Bank of India or the RBI. So ideally, the RBI would be the right regulatory authority to approach because if the mm-hmm. allegations were true, then Chanda Kochar and her associates were effectively breaching multiple banking and lending regulations. So there'd also be certain corporate laws that would be violated by these allegations as well. But the RBI did not take this complaint seriously at the time. In fact, Arvind Gupta claims that he also wrote to other law enforcement, including the Enforcement Directorate, the Security Exchange Board of India, the Central Bureau of Investigation and the Serious Fraud Investigation Office. He claims he sent in an eight-page complaint detailing his findings, but none of them responded. Yeah. Hmm. So he also claims to have sent the complaints to the Prime Minister's office around March 2016, but he received silence there as well. Oof. So, while it sucks really hard that Arvind Gupta was ignored for quite a bit, mm-hmm. at the very least, he would be vindicated in a couple of years. Mm-hmm. The 2016 whistleblower complaint was ignored, yes, but in 2018, this resurfaced all over again. Hmm. Now, the reason this came up again is interesting though. The year 2017 was a bad one for a large chunk of the Indian economy Mm -hmm. as many, many banks were facing a consistent issue of non-performing assets. In fact, the RBI was forced to step in to take cognizance of the matter, forcing Mm -hmm. companies with bad loans to address their issues. So basically like 2008, global Mm -hmm. financial crisis, but it kind of happened to us later. Yeah, things come to India late only a little bit like McDonald's, Mm -hmm. uh, the iPhone, Mm-hmm. Oh, legalization of same-sex marriage. Ah, oh my God, it's Pride Month. Hi, it is. <laughs> it is Happy indeed Pride Month. Pride. Happy Pride Month. <laughs> it is indeed. You know what? And even if you're not listening to this in June, if you're listening to it later, every month is Pride <laughs> Month. Yes. Because... They live among us. Come on, you guys. Play the Among Us music again. (laughs) Now, as per the RBI, a non-performing asset or NPA is basically an asset that no longer generated revenue or income for a bank. More specifically, if the principal or interest payment for a loan remained overdue for a period of 90 days, Mm -hmm. the asset effectively becomes non-performing. Okay. Now, the NPA crisis was written about everywhere with about 9% of all loans being gradually declared as NPAs. Okay. Public sector banks fared worse with about 12% of loans being bad. Oof. All right. So the government too stepped in and passed the financial resolution and deposit insurance bill to address this issue. And the RBI was given wider powers to tackle the issue with suffering banks. Okay. I, um, yeah, I love it. And banks get uh, Mm. their hand held like this. Yeah. Meanwhile, I forget to pay my credit card bill one time. (laughs) Once. And the bank is suddenly like, oh, sorry, Raghvi, you can never buy a house ever again. I mean, in this economy, you can never buy a house anyway. But That's true. But I can't even be like, oh, can I at least (laughs) get a loan to buy one TV a scooter? No, never. (laughs) Nothing. You get nothing because one time you forgot. Use use a (laughs) Yulu. I swear. (laughs) The thing that most people don't tell you is where does the bank get the money to blow away on these random assets? Mm -hmm. Surprise, surprise. It's our money. It's your money. Yeah. So, 
it's the money that you put into savings accounts, fixed deposits and debt funds that your banks keep trying to sell to you. Mm -hmm. It's money that you worked hard to earn. Most of you, at least. Uh, Some of you are influencers. The (laughs) bank finds it okay to play around with. Which, Mm. I mean, I get that's what banks are supposed to do. But... Mm -hmm. After all of these like bad decisions, if the bank loses money to some terrible mobile app that delivers fresh fertilizer for your bougainvillea plant or something. Oh, an app for just bougainvilleas? Yes, don't say it loudly. SoftBank will come to invest. (laughs) That's true. (laughs) Yeah. But yeah, so if something like that happens, it's your money that's going. In any case, uh, that's what a lot of banks did resulting in the NPA crisis of 2017 to 18. Just bad decisions, bad loans. And this is where the allegations that Arvind Gupta brought up are relevant again. Mm -hmm. So in March 2018, two whole years after his first complaint, Arvind Gupta found that there was renewed interest in Videocon's loans and infinitely more interest in what Chanda Kochar had to do with all of it. And now, this is where we stop for the episode. No, I just got interested. <laughs> oh. It's okay. The next episode will pick up where we left off. And there's mm-hmm. a lot more. What happens to loans that go bad? What happens when these loans have sinister background stories? Mm-hmm. And what happens, like the CNBC article said, when mm-hmm. a woman shatters the glass ceiling and then proceeds to step all over the shards? I don't even want to do the outro for this episode because that's a beautiful way to end it, isn't it? But yeah, no. we'll do it. We'll do the outro, guys. Listen to the other episodes on the IVM <laughs> Podcast Network or wherever you get your podcast. We are everywhere. Please mm-hmm. just find us and leave reviews for us everywhere. Apple, Spotify, YouTube, whatever you can find. Just reach out to us and tell us you love us. Yes. Mm-hmm. And Ashley, you can also reach out to us in person as you may have realized this is the penultimate episode for this season. Mm-hmm. So, uh, we are planning this like cute little meetup on the 17th of June. It's a Saturday. Yes. Mm-hmm. Somewhere in Bangalore. We will let you know the details on our Instagram page. Mm-hmm. So, come catch up with us. Let's have some chai tea. And, uh, oh. <laughs> and no, we're not, we're not going to a Starbucks. Turmeric latte. Say it. You yeah. Say it. Turmeric lattes. I'm lactose intolerant. I don't know why I'm promoting Yeah, this. I don't even understand that. <laughs> but um, we will be putting this stuff up on Instagram. Um, 17th June 2023 is the alleged, that's not the right word, <laughs> tentative date for this. Uh, but um, if something else works for you guys, we'll work it out. We'll work all of this out on Instagram. Reach out to us anyway on Instagram on at misconductpod. Tell us how you've liked the season so far and all of the episodes that you like. And we love talking to you there. And we will see you on the next exciting final episode of this season of Misconduct. <laughs> <laughs>